Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. Well, April is approaching, and for many of us, we know it's time for that dreaded tax return to be filled out. For many of us, though, we kind of celebrate the ecstasy of realizing we may get a tax refund. In fact, most of us more or less treat the IRS as though there's some sort of a bank account that we get to keep our money in, of course, tax-free as well as interest-free, for the government to do whatever they want, just so long as we get some of that money back. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio program today is author of more than a dozen books on taxpayer rights. He also defends and achieved a national record renown, excuse me, as the premier defender of taxpayer rights. His work has been recognized on major networks and as well as been featured in major magazines around the country. He also works a tax policy consultant to former presidents, and he's also here to champion our rights as taxpayers. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 Radio program today, our guest, Dan Daniel Pilla. We're going to be talking about his book, How to Double Your Tax Refund. Daniel, thank you for joining us back here on the Beyond 50 Radio program today. Hey, it's my pleasure, Dan. Thanks for having you know, me. We get tongue-tied a lot when we talk about taxes, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, that, if that's all that happened with taxes, we'd be in pretty good shape, but unfortunately that's not the case. Now, this particular book, uh, just to let listeners know, was actually written uh, pre-Y2K, so we're also uh, pre-9-11 as well. So how have things changed since then? Well, it, of course, there have been a number of different changes, Dan, but the, uh, the, 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 the basic premise of the book is the same. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, while there's tweaks in dollar amounts in the various deductions and things that I talk about in the book, the, the deductions themselves are, are still valid. I think one of the key points that I make in the book that, that is just simply a universal proposition is that the, the vast majority of Americans who get tax refunds, and that's about 85% of the people that file tax returns, by the way, the vast majority of those people that get refunds uh, are not doing themselves a favor by getting a tax refund. Uh, what I point out in the book is that the IRS is holding your money for at least 14 months, in many cases uh, 16 and 18 months, without paying you a nickel's worth of interest, and you never get the full amount of the refund back because by the time you get your refund for 2015, let's say, you know, you're going to file your tax return in, in, in March or April of 2016, right? So, so now, you're, now you're, tw- uh, you're, you're 14 or 15 months into this withholding process. By the time you get your tax refund, let's say April or May, uh, okay, you got all your money back for 2015, but now the IRS has another four or five months worth of overwithholding in 2016. So you're never made whole. You've never got all your money back when you are paying in too much. And, and here's the other premise that's universal. It doesn't make any difference uh, when, when we're talking about this idea. The fact is that it's just simply true across the board, and that is uh, you have the right to adjust your withholding to match your tax liability. There's no rule of law that requires you to pay more taxes than you owe. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the government did not get religion and decide to do you a favor by by giving you a tax refund. That's not what happened. You're getting a tax refund because you paid too much in taxes to begin with, and you don't have a legal responsibility to do that. You have a responsibility to pay the taxes you owe, there's no question about that. You've got a responsibility to pay, to pay the taxes you owe on time. There's no question about that. But you do not have a, a, a responsibility to pay more than you owe, and, and, and you're just not doing yourself a favor when you do that. Now, you say the biggest thing for a lot of people, especially when it comes to people who, of course, are receiving a W-2 income, is they really don't understand, nor do they fill out the W-4 form. Tell us more about that, because this is one of the biggest areas that people need to be concerned with, because it's right there at their fingertips, and A, understanding what it is and what it does. Yeah, you're exactly right, and that is the key to the overwithholding. That is the key to paying too much in taxes is the W-4 form. Now, what is the W-4? Well, that's the form that you file with, you submit to your employer, when you're hired, the uh, the employer requires you to fill out the W-4, which contains, your, of course, your name and your address and your Social Security number and all of that stuff. And that is the form uh, on which you claim a number of withholding allowances. And so people will will fill out the form and they'll say, okay, I'm married with, with two kids, and so 
I write down four allowances on the W-4. Or if, you're, if your spouse is working and your spouse has already claimed a couple of allowances, well, then you can't double up, and so maybe you just claim two allowances on the W-4. But the W-4 form is the form that's submitted with the employer that tells the employer how to withhold from you. If you don't submit a W-4 at all, then they're required to withhold as if you're a single person with no allowances, which, of course, means the IRS takes about half your money. So, you know, people submit the W-4 form, and, and, uh, and, and they report these withholding allowances. But here's what the problem is, Dan. People don't understand what they're supposed to fill in on that form. When they, when they think in terms of withholding, they think in terms of, of dependent exemptions only. And, and we're... we're, we're attuned to thinking that way. We're accustomed to thinking that way. We think, well, I can only claim the number of exemptions on this form that I would be entitled to on my tax return. For for example, go back to the married couple with two kids. I, I, I'm married. I have a spouse. I have two kids. That's four exemptions. That's the number that I would put down on my tax return, and so that's the number I have to put down on the W on the W-4. But that's not accurate. All right? What happens is, is an exemption... Uh, the, the W-4 form is, is, the, is the, a form that allows you to report the number of withholding allowances that you're entitled to. An allowance, Dan, is any item on a tax return, any tax return item that would reduce your tax liability. Now, there's no question that exemptions reduce your tax liability. There's no doubt about that. Your taxable income is reduced by plus or minus $4,600 for every exemption you claim on the return. But that's not the only thing that reduces tax liability. Tax liabilities are also reduced by itemized deductions, for example. Uh, if you claim charitable contributions, mortgage interest, real estate taxes, all of those things reduce your taxable income as well. Likewise, contributions to a retirement plan, 401k or IRA, those reduce your tax liability. Child tax credits reduce your tax liability. All of these things come into play in dictating the number of allowances that you're entitled to claim on your, on your tax return. And so if you are simply claiming allowances equal to your dependent exemptions, you're under, uh, you, you, are, you are over withholding. In other words, you're paying the IRS too much money, and you're going to get a tax refund at the end of the year that is actually in the long run costing you a lot of money. Now, here's one of the interesting things that I discovered, and, and it's one that I think a lot of people listening today really should pay attention to and really consider, and that is starting your own business. That does some amazing things when it comes to uh, doubling, even tripling your tax refund. Yeah, no question about it, uh, particularly if it's a home-based business. Uh, you know, as, as you know, you are not allowed to claim a deduction on your tax return for any expenses that are purely personal in nature. Now, if you own a home, you get a deduction for your mortgage interest and your real estate taxes if those expenses exceed the, the standard deduction. Uh, if, if the house is paid for, of course, now you don't have any mortgage interest, so now you just got real estate taxes, and, it, it, and unless you've got other itemized deductions, you know, you might not be in a position where you're, where you're paying more than the standard deduction, and so you just don't get much more benefit from it. Uh, but if you are operating a business out of your home, and this is a legitimate for-profit undertaking, then what happens is a portion of the expenses that are otherwise non-deductible become deductible because a portion of those expenses are now attributed to the business. Let, let me give you an example. Suppose you got 1,500 square feet in your house, and you use... 10% of that, of that space, you use 150 square feet for your, your home office. You, you've got a, a spare bedroom with a desk, a chair, your file cabinet, your fax machine, your phone, your computer, all the things you need to do uh, business with. And that space is used regularly and exclusively for business purposes. Well, now what happens is 10% of all the expenses associated with operating the home become business expenses. Now, this is important because these expenses you are paying anyway, and you're not getting a deduction for them. So in other words, you're not increasing your out-of-pocket costs, but what you're doing is you're increasing the deductions that you're allowed to claim on the out-of-pocket costs that already exist. So it's a significant benefit. You don't have to spend more money to get the benefit of the deduction. The key, of course, is to be able to show, if, if, if you're questioned, that the business is a, is a legitimate for-profit operation. Mm -hmm. 
So just to be clear on this, I remember that I was, and I'm not a tax advisor, but it was through an experience that I had had that I actually shared this with a lady. I said, you know, your husband, he talks about how he's supporting you in starting this business, but he doesn't seem that he's all in. And I said, did you realize that he could start getting some of the money back that he pays out in taxes for withholding by running the money through a business account and paying the bills that you guys are already paying, just like what you're talking about. You're paying for electricity, you're paying for water, you're paying for food, you're paying for your mortgage, whatever the case may be. And she says, really? And I said, yeah. And I said, that'll get him excited about the fact that you've actually started something. He can get a lot of that money back, if not all of it, or even more. Well, and, and, and that's certainly possible. There's no question right. about that. Uh, but, but, the, but the key is, you know, you're not going to be able to write off all of the home expenses. Uh, you know, you're just not going to get a hundred percent deduction for the for the home expenses. There's there's no question about that, uh, because you're still using a, a a significant portion of your home uh, for personal purposes, i.e., living, right? And, and you just don't get a deduction for that. So so the deduction has got to be based on a percentage of the square footage of the home that's used for business purposes, called a business use percentage. I gave you that example of ten percent. So so to, 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 to extrapolate that out a little further, Dan, you know, suppose you're paying $800 a month for utilities and you're, you're claiming, uh, you're claiming 10% of the business use. Well, now $80 of that 800 becomes a tax deduction. And, you know, that might not seem like a lot, but you've got to go through and add up all the various expenses that are, that are associated with your home. They're significant in every case. And now you're getting a, at least a partial deduction for expenses you're paying anyway. Exactly right. That was the thing that I pointed out, and she just was blown away, and I'm thinking to myself, it's amazing how little we know about these kinds of things. <laughs> well, well, it is. I mean, listen, we got, a ta- we got a tax code that now consists of upwards of 4 million words, Dan. And they don't even count pages in this tax code anymore because they, you know, they don't print the stupid thing. It just comes out in electronic form these days. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's now upwards of 4 million words in the tax code. And that's not even the worst part of it. The worst part of it is, is, is the thing has changed hundreds of times every year. The average number of tax law changes uh, dur- during the first decade of the, of the 21st century, about 500 tax code changes every single year. And, and so it's 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 difficult it's difficult for people to keep up with this stuff, and you know unless you're doing this full time, um, you know it's it's very very difficult. I, I would say unless you're doing this full time, it's impossible to stay up with all this stuff, and and that's where you know that's where most people get themselves in trouble. And, and frankly, Dan, that's why most people have given up uh, filing. Um, itemized deductions, claiming deductions on their tax returns at all anyway. Uh, you know, about 70% of all the tax returns filed in America are short forms, forms 1040A or 1040EZ. And, and those forms don't claim any deductions. It's just a standard deduction. And people just, and, and the reason for that, I think, largely is people have thrown their hands up and said, this is too complicated. I don't want to do this. It's too much trouble. It's not worth it. Uh, and in fact, they're just costing themselves more and more money every year. Mm-hmm. Now, it's interesting because there's one particular deduction they, that people can have that started back in, I believe it was 1996, and that is the, uh, trying to think of it now, it's the uh, health insurance deduction or health savings account. Yeah, it's a, it's a health savings right. account, and, 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 uh, and that was something that, uh, that was started as a, as a pilot program uh, let's see, was it 96? It might have been 96 or 98, I forget. It started as a pilot program, and then it was, it was rolled out in full scale in 2003 as part of the Bush tax, tax plan. Uh, but the problem with it, with the, and, and the HSA is a great thing, and it's, and it's still available to folks if, if you've got the right insurance policy. Uh, but one of the things that, uh, that the Obamacare plan has done, uh, the Obamacare disaster, let me put it that way, has done is it will begin phasing those things out. So, so you know, not only is your insurance costing you more money uh, under Obamacare, but but in 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 future years, it's not the case now, but in future years, you won't even be able to use an HSA if Obamacare stays the way it is. Which who knows if that's going to be the case or not. Well, I was going to ask you because you're kind of an insider there whether or not it was going to change, but obviously we won't know until that time comes. Yeah, we we just won't know. Okay. Yep. Now there are some uh, long forgotten ways that people can claim. Tell us some of those uh, things that people are overlooking that they could be doing right now. 
Well, you know, let, let's let's just start with the basic things, and that is uh, everything. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> I, 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 I say that, and it's not, and it's not quite tongue in cheek. Uh, you know, I mentioned just a moment ago that the fact of the matter is that most people have given up claiming deductions altogether uh, because they uh, they uh, uh, don't think it's worth it. Uh, the fact is that you know, I'm, I'm asked, what is the single most overlooked deduction? And I say all of them. <laughs> Because, because as I said, most people just simply are not claiming the deductions that they're entitled to claim at all, uh, because they, uh, because they, uh, you know, they think it's too much effort, it's it's too much, uh, you know, too much difficulty, and so forth, and, and that just isn't the case. And so, uh, it, and and so, you, you know, you, you just want to take advantage of this stuff to the extent that you can. Now, as far as as far as uh, um, you know, forgotten deductions are concerned. You know, there's, there's, I've got a, I've got a whole chapter in the book that deals with, uh, with specific uh, deductions. Um, you know, I, I would, I would, uh, I would say, for example, um, you know, a lot of people don't write off their computers and cell phones, uh, even though they may be using those things uh, as a, as an integral p- component of their business. Uh, you know, even if you've got a job, uh, a W-2 job, and you don't have you don't have your own self-employed business, if you're required by your employer to stay in contact with your office, uh, you you probably have a legitimate uh, deduction at least for a portion of your cell phone. And and if and if you're not uh, a w- if you're a W-2 wage earner, then that would go as a miscellaneous itemized deduction as opposed to a business expense. Same is true with a home computer. Again, if you're required to use that home computer for uh, for for your job or business purposes to stay connected with the office to do internet research to communicate with with emails and so forth then those become uh, you know very important um, very important deductions as well uh, you know a lot a lot of people overlook uh, a lot of people are in trouble with the Internal Revenue Service and and uh, and and we've got a situation right now Dan where we're Fully 25% of the population has some kind of challenge with the IRS. Maybe it's a simple notice uh, that they've got to respond to, or, or you know, gather records and prove you know some simple deduction on the tax return. Or maybe it's a very serious collection problem uh, to the point where they're paying legal fees to be represented in front of the IRS. Those legal fees are tax deductible. Any tax professional, in fact, any expense that you pay to educate yourself about the IRS. Even the payment of even the purchase of my books, Dan, are tax deductible, and people overlook that. And so, any legal fees that you incur to fight the IRS, or any expenses that you incur uh, for the purposes of, of educating yourself concerning the IRS, these are tax deductible fees. No, no question about that. Uh, another thing that people overlook are investment expenses. You know, there's a lot of folks out there with uh, with uh, investments of some kind. Uh, that uh, that uh, they're you know they're managing on their self or th- themselves or, or they have somebody to manage for them. Uh, these investment expenses are also tax deductible. This could include uh, investment counseling fees or subscription fees to uh, to uh, magazines or internet sites or whatever. Account custodian fees are tax deductible. Uh, you know any transfer fees. Uh, all of that stuff is are, 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 are tax deductible that people overlook. Uh, of course, if you're a small business, if you're operating a business out of your out of your home, uh, or you've got a small business where where you have a shop or an office that you go to every day, any expense that's incurred for the purposes of earning income is tax deductible. And so you you got to ask yourself, what am I spending money on? The purpose of which is to generate revenue for my business. All of those expenses are deductible, whether it's advertising or auto expenses, or you know, if you've got to purchase uh, educational material, books, manuals. If you've got to go through annual education to to stay up with your job, to keep uh, to keep licenses current, those kinds of things. Uh, you know, any any uh, any uh, printing, stationery, business cards. You know, development of a website. All of these stuff, cleaning costs. Uh, trips and, and so forth, entertainment expenses, you know, on and on and on is 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 uh, are things that people regularly overlook, and so you you just want to you want to be careful about understanding what uh, what specific expenses you can you can write off. You know, Daniel, it's always an interesting conversation with you because this is probably going to make some people cringe uh, as they hear this, but the IRS really seems to want to help. They just don't want you screwing them. And I remember the last time we were on the telephone that. Uh, that really the IRS has the perception of public, and probably for right reason, that that's our intention, that we're out there really to make sure that they get cheated somehow. 
and that's what they're really holding on for. But if you actually engage these people, uh, a lot of times they're really there to kind of help you out, aren't they? Well, there's a listen. There's there's ninety five thousand employees in the Internal Revenue Service, Dan, and and and, and you know it would simply be a, a false statement to say that every single one of those employees is, is trying to is trying to you know put the screws to people. That's just simply not true. Uh, I I think the majority of IRS employees are are trying to help. I think you're right about that. I think the fact of the matter is, however, is I is they're doing uh, they're doing an impossible job under very difficult. Circumstances, and what I mean by an impossible job is the complexity of the Internal Revenue Code has, has reached a point where, where um, you know, the tax law changes themselves uh, have, have just made it virtually impossible for for people to understand it. Former IRS Commissioner uh, Charles Rosati made the statement once. He was a commissioner in, in uh, right at the turn of the century in 2000, right in that period of time, and, and that's that's before the decade of of Changes that occurred at the pace of 500 a year. Okay, so this was this was before the, all of that started. He was called to account one time uh, for uh, for a report that was produced by the by the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, that said that the IRS was was answering taxpayer questions wrong about 30 percent of the time. In other words, they were only getting the answers right about 70 percent of the time. And and these were basic tax law questions. This wasn't complicated stuff. So the IRS wasn't giving the American people the right answers to help them comply with the law. And, and Rosati, the commissioner at that time, was asked to explain this. And, and, and Rosati said that we that and this is a quote now from him. He says it we are attempting the impossible. He says our the the, the, the scope and complexity of the tax code is now so great that our training manuals are unfeasible in terms of their size and the scope of the manuals. They are simply unfeasible and unwielding. And and the and the <laughs> the fact is, Dan, that that was before the decade of tax law changes that occurred at the pace of 500 a year. So so Rosati put his finger on something that Congress just has simply ignored for for the last you know coming up on 20 years now, and that is they have got to stop changing the law as much as they do but they but it's getting worse every year not better now what is it about them that causes them to do this well it's congress it's co well, it's, well it, what is what causes congress to do this well well look at here's the thing about the tax laws people ask me this and, and this is an extent this is this is the, the an extension of your question uh why are our tax laws co so complicated that's a question i hear all the time why is congress doing this and the reason is because our tax laws have become uh, something which they were never intended to be. The, the Constitution of the United States gives the Congress the power to uh, to raise taxes for for very narrow purposes. Dan, they, they have the power to raise taxes for only three things. Number one is to provide the national defense. Number two is to pay the expenses of the government, and 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 that, and, and number three is to provide for the general welfare. All right, general red broad, general red, everybody, not particular uh, segments of the population or particular interest groups. General meaning very broad. Now, what has happened, however, is the tax laws have become something other than a means of raising revenue to, to do those three things. The tax laws have become uh, a means of, of buying and selling legislative favors. In other words, Congress uses the tax laws as a form of congressional currency to buy and sell legislative favors. If you back my legislation here, you know, we can back your legislation there, and they trade the tax laws off because that has the most impact. The, the other thing the tax laws do is Congress uses these laws to pick winners and losers in the marketplace. In other words, we, uh, uh, an entire component of our tax code is focused on this idea of quote-unquote social justice. The problem is nobody knows what social justice means, and the definition changes every two years anyway when Congress changes hands, or at least when the... Uh, when the uh, 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 you know the, the power of the force of Congress shifts uh, from time to time, and and so what they're doing is is they use the tax codes to reward certain behavior that they have deemed uh, that they have deemed uh, um, um, desirable, and they use the tax code to penalize certain other behavior that they deem to be detrimental for some reason or another. 
instead of letting the marketplace work itself and let businesses succeed or fail on their own merits, they intervene with these tax laws that create incentives or disincentives to do or not do something that people otherwise wouldn't do or, or would do in, in, in some other event. So, so and, and then, oh, by the way, number three on the list is, yeah, we've got to get some money besides that. So that's the reason the tax code is so complicated, because they're not using it simply as a means to raise revenue. It, there is no question in my mind that we could, we could drastically, I mean radically, simplify the tax code and raise more money. Not that I'm in favor of raising more money for the federal government. <laughs> They're getting $3.5 trillion a year the way it is, which is way too much. But, but you, the, the fact of the matter is that a simplified tax code would raise more revenue than the complex code we have now. Mm -hmm. And not to mention, too, is the fact that they've actually cut back the budget on the IRS, as I understand it. Well, yeah, there been some. There were there were some cutbacks uh, in the in the last few years with the sequesterization and so on. Uh, the, the number of IRS employees has, has fallen uh, fallen a, a you know a fair amount. Um, you know, the high water mark for IRS employees is about one hundred five thousand, and I think I think the low water mark during the mid, during the latter part of of the first uh, of the second decade of the century twenty. You know, 8, 20, uh, 20, uh, 29, 2010, right in there. Uh, that would be the first century, uh, first decade of the century. Um, they they fell back to about 85,000 employees. Right now, they're about 95,000 employees. So they have picked up some of that. But the fact of the matter is that uh, that uh, you, you know they've they've had some they've had some some budget issues. But the, but here's what the problem with that is. Listen, they, 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 they squawk, and this is, I take issue with the IRS on this, and I take issue with Congress on this. And, oh, we've got to give the IRS more money because they can't collect. Listen, fewer than 2% of all of the tax revenue that's paid into the federal government is collected through enforcement action. Less than 2% of all of the revenue collected by the IRS is, 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 is paid through enforcement action, wage levies, bank levies, that sort of thing. What that means, Dan, is 98% of every dollar that goes to the IRS is paid voluntarily by a taxpayer trying to do the right thing at the right time. All right? <laughs> so, so, to, so to say that because we don't have more money for enforcement that the system is going to fall apart is utter nonsense. Now, here's what the problem is. To the extent that the IRS has had budget cuts, it's not the enforcement arm of the IRS that's felt that budget cut. It's the education arm. What the IRS is doing is they're making taxpayers pay for the fact that Congress has, 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 uh, has uh, cut, you know, has, has, has sequestered money in certain areas by not educating taxpayers on what their responsibilities and what their duties are. So they're making it harder for the average taxpayer to comply as opposed to making it easier. The IRS should be spending more time and energy on education than any other element of the tax code because when taxpayers know what their responsibilities are and, and, are, and, and are willing to comply, which the vast majority of them are, the collection is much cheaper than going out with, with heavy-handed enforcement tactics like wage levies and tax liens and property seizures and so on. Mm -hmm. It simply is cheaper to educate people to do what they're supposed to do than to grind them into a powder later on when they didn't. Yeah. It's pretty amazing to realize what really goes on out there. And I'm kind of curious uh, for our listeners out there, where is a website people can find out more about your books, uh, what you do, uh, and all that? Yeah, the uh, website is called TaxHelpOnline.com. It's all one word, TaxHelpOnline.com. When you go to the home page, we've got a whole bunch of uh, options there, including a number of free special reports. There's a, there's a, a, there's a, a, a great deal of free information on my site. Uh, TaxHelpOnline.com, in addition to links for all of my books, including my most recent book, which is called How to Win Your Tax Audit, which takes you step-by-step -step through the tax audit process, shows you how to avoid an audit, shows you how to deal with IRS problems and how to avoid IRS problems in the first place. And so uh, that book, uh, How to Win Your Tax Audit, plus my book, How to Double Your Tax Refund, plus all my materials on that website, TaxHelpOnline.com. And just to let the listeners know out there, because we've had you on the program and I've had the opportunity to read your books, what it is, it's very encouraging to realize this is very, very manageable. And, yes, you can learn and understand this, and you can become very empowered. So if you start getting those notices and getting pushed around, well, maybe it's time you got up to try to understand this the best you can, or if not, find a professional that can at least help you navigate through these kind of sometimes rather troubled waters. Daniel, thank you 
so much for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Dan. You bet. Well, I want to thank you, the listeners out there. Remember, tax time doesn't have to be that big of a burden. You can also discover more by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. Please sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter as well. You can follow us on Facebook at Beyond 50 Radio as well as Twitter. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.